I'm Sarah Williamson, and this is Going Long with FCLT Global. On this show, you'll learn what it means to be long-term from the top minds in global business and investing. Leaders from companies and investment organizations join us to discuss how they are leading their teams for the long run on issues including capital allocation, risk management, climate change, and sustainability. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org. My guest today is Clark Murphy. Clark is the Chief Executive Officer of Russell Reynolds Associates and serves on its Board of Directors. Prior to his appointment as CEO, he was a global leader of the firm's CEO and board services practice. Clark has over 30 years of experience in the executive recruiting industry and joined Russell Reynolds Associates in 1988. Now based in New York, he's also worked in the firm's Frankfurt and London offices. So Clark, thank you very much for joining us today. That's great to be here. I appreciate it. It's a great topic. Well, as you know, what we care about at FCLT is is long term and thinking about how do companies and investors really make those right long term decisions that are sometimes hard to do in the in the pressure of the moment. Um, And one of the things that I know Russell Reynolds has done is um, has explored the attributes that make executive leaders effective at driving those long-term outcomes. Can can we start by talking about what the strongest characteristics of a long-term oriented CEO are? Absolutely. And I think um, recognizing that that how one defines the long-term oriented CEO has changed and will continue to change over time. So the visionary of, of 20 years ago or the offshoring outsourcing or the cost cutting or the growth m a or, or now in the pandemic kind of surviving, it shifts, all right? But the fundamental underpinnings are that a longer term C- oriented CEO who used to, he or she was probably more hierarchical, probably more execution oriented against the plan they set. Well, we know now that plans go out the door in, in a pandemic or a global financial crisis. So. We think that that the, the nature of those CEOs has changed. And we find now that that kind of hierarchical stick to the plan, execute well, the best long-term oriented CEOs really are showing more agility, their ability to pivot when they need to. They deal with ambiguity before, where before they said there will be no ambiguity. This is the plan and this is the strategy. And their communication skills are you could have the most agility, the most ambiguity, a great strategy, be a great operator. But if you cannot communicate in today's world with all stakeholders, then you will fail and some have failed. So we think fundamentally that uh, relationship building, pragmatism, agility uh, defines who these longer term CEOs are. And we have found they're more likely to have had cross-functional experience and certainly international experience. Um, And the last thing I'd say, Sarah, is there's a perception when you and I talk about long-term that those leaders may not be focused on short-term success as well. There is not a trade-off. In fact, we would say that these long-term oriented CEOs are very successful in the short-term results because they're building foundations for the long-term as well. So the role has shifted. The experiences have shifted, but they're not giving up short term because they're long term oriented. Yeah, that's such an important point. I mean, when we see um, uh, executives that we call short term, we usually mean they're taking a shortcut, which would right, you know right. not lead to a good long term outcome. Uh, but of course, any any CEO has to execute every day, um, and uh, so 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 really do both. Now, that's a tall order for CEOs to do all of those things that you just named. Um, And we have noticed that CEO tenure is shortening. Do you think that that is because there is um, too too many things asked of CEOs? They're they're good for one environment, but the environment changes and they they can't pivot to a different environment? Or what, what factors do you think are contributing to the decline of CEO tenure? Yeah, I mean, I think it's multivariable, as you would expect. And just some facts. You take the S&P 500 between 2013 and 2015, 
and 13% of CEOs appointed during that period left within three years, half of those left in less than two. So um, turnover is high. So why is it high? I think the changing nature of the role and the complexity of the role uh, makes it more difficult. And these are not untested leaders or unsophisticated enterprises. They are, these are successful leaders, but why did they fail? I think some, uh, some is that what was, I said before, what's asked of them today is different than it was 10, 30 years ago. Um, and many of them have been uh, promoted on technical expertise, but that's not the skill set anymore, what makes them successful as a CEO. So the fact that you have to have this agility, the fact that we're in a world where culture and diversity in the workplace taking a stand uh, on social issues, the communication skills we talked about before. Um, and you also have to realize that the role of the CEO, I believe, my words, is the role of the transformer now, not the operator only. So let's think about telecom, media, retail, my goodness, energy, supply chains. They're either transforming or some of them are in survival mode. Think about Neiman Marcus or, or some of these uh, retailers through the pandemic. Also public company versus private and forbid they're regulated on top of all of it. So the complexity of the job, um, the changing nature of the criteria to be successful in the job uh, and the pressures of the world today, I think make it difficult. But the biggest thing is the world thinks it ends when they're appointed. Successful CEOs, first time CEOs, the first 12 to 18 months are still formative in the job. And I think, um, and we see it at Russell Reynolds Associates that th they think the selection process ends the succession process. No, succession is that succeeding over time. So we think the transition, CEO transition can largely determine success in the first year, not just selection. So let's talk about um, succession then. It's a good segue. So um, you're right that so many people think about, oh, we need a new CEO. Let's go interview candidates. We find somebody. Terrific. Our, our job is done. What do you see um, making that that process really work. So what, what is the recruitment to succession to, to succeeding, as you said, how do, how do you marry that with either bringing um, a CEO from outside into a company and integrating them in the long-term strategy? Or as you said, sometimes perhaps that person that you're promoting has been an, you know, an excellent operator of one of the divisions or one of the countries or whatever it may be. <clears throat> then has to, you know, change some decisions that they may have made in the past. So, so how do you, how do you help them through that whole process? Right. So first of all, my, forgive me, my pet peeve. Okay. Uh, the succession process is what we call it, not a succession plan. Why? Silly, silly um, uh, choice of words. Because if plans go wrong, people can freak out. Processes build in flexibility. So if you're, the succession plan is X, Y, and Z, and a pandemic shows up and uh, X and Y get thrown out, then uh, you're doubling on a crisis. So a succession process is a long-term strategy. It involves what does the company need in the future? Let's define the competencies needed to achieve that future. Let's start with a three years in advance to look at the competencies of those executives potentially as the next leader. And it is, it is the ongoing grooming of multiple candidates to fill the role when the firm is ready. Replacement is about choosing against current options. Succession is about creating new options for the present and future. So what, what do I mean by that? New options is this leader could do it today, this leader can do it with this development in two years. This leader may not be the chief executive, but let's create options to retain that executive to work for the next CEO. So a succession process, a good succession process involves looking beyond candidates past experience to their ability to address future need. 
So we're grooming them for the future. We're developing multiple people for a future. Um, and then the transition post-selection and the retention of the best people post-selection is still part of the succession process for that first year. So what are the future needs? Define them, groom against them, make decisions against them, have a one-year transition post-selection. That is a succession process of three years or so. That sounds like the way it should be done. Um, of course, it's not always the way that it happens. How do you think about, how is that different when, um, as we talked about before, CEO tenure was unexpectedly short or um, a CEO fails? If you're in one of those situations, you're trying to have that future-oriented strategy, you're trying to have that you know, long-term mindset but some, I mean, life happens, right? Some, or somebody, you know, gets ill, something, I mean, th things happen. How, sure. how, do you, how, do you, how do you pivot when you're, you've got a great process, um, but something goes awry? And it does. And it could be someone leaves to be a chief executive elsewhere. Uh, you could have a hostile offer. You could end up with new directors you didn't count on because of activism. So that's, this is, that is the real world. So that's why you want flexibility. And that's why you're focused on a group of people not just on the one selection. So if something does go wrong, you're, you're hopefully developing in a perfect world, multiple options, but we don't live in a perfect world. Um, so then one has to offset. You may then say, we're gonna choose Sarah to be the chief executive. She has these strengths and these developmental needs because it's all happening a year sooner. So does Sarah need a COO? Does Sarah need a non-executive chairman? Does Sarah need a head of communications? Does she need a stronger, more communicative CFO than a, than a kind of control-oriented, more numbers person? We have to look at how Sarah is, is um, wrapped with the best team or, or the best leadership from the board to maximize her strengths and offset her development needs with, with other, uh, what we would call scaffolding. Let's scaffold Sarah successfully. No, that makes a lot of sense. And if you think about the investors, you mentioned the activists and the role that sometimes they play by perhaps unexpectedly being on a board, um, changing that process. How should, you know, many of FCLT Global's members are investors. How do you think about the long-term investors being involved in this succession process? Do they just wait and see, you know, who's been named or is there something that is more proactive that they could do um, to be supportive uh, as, as these processes go along. So uh, I, I would talk about first investors and then regulators, okay? Uh, and, and we get deeply involved with both. So <clears throat> the, um, they don't have decision power, but they have significant influence. Um, so over, over, over communicating about the process uh, the needs of the company um, and what's going on in that process, not naming names and naming resumes, but, but the uh, either board members cultivating institutional investors, uh, it could be activists as well, um, or uh, investors in terms of analysts on Wall Street or you know, major institutional investors, overly communicating this multi-year process. And then I would say slightly different with regulators where we've been very involved with banks, airlines, utilities, uh, amongst other regulated industries, where you are going at maybe the 10th hour, not the 12th hour, and saying to the regulator, um, this is what we're thinking. We're, we're uh, thinking about it and curious if you think we're thinking about this the right way, which is different than saying, do you approve or not approve? Um, and this is our approach, this is our thinking, and these are people we're considering um, and get their, their feedback and their directional uh, advice. And I think <clears throat> that way there are no surprises either with investors or regulators. No surprises is a, is a good rule on these um, things. You mentioned private companies before and obviously many executives um, may have the opportunity to work for a public company or work for a private company. Do you see the succession process 
in, for example, a private equity backed portfolio company or other sorts of private companies being very different from what you would see in the in the public markets, um, you know, assuming it's the same regulatory environment and so on, or or do you think they're they're pretty similar? Uh, can you compare and contrast for us? Yes, I mean, okay, so so it's a private company, or we should talk about family-owned businesses as well, uh, and I do think there are dif- there are differences in in those processes from a public company, um, whether the scale of the private company. <clears throat> And they're you know, huge private companies, uh, Cargill and Mars, and they're small private companies, right? But does, does the scale of the company allow for multiple candidates in a multi-year process? We have found many times that private companies say, <clears throat> it's, it, it's a one-person succession process, so therefore the, the volatility is high of a success or not success, and they take that risk, particularly private equity-backed who say, you know, this is their business taking risk. And so they tend to often, uh, uh, in, in most size companies, not the massive largest cap, they're gonna roll the dice on that. And I would say the level of, uh, there never used to be any psychological testing or, or simulation uh, by private, ac- com- private equity backed companies that has changed significantly in the last three or four years that um, having looked at all the assets, they never really, tested or uh, pressure tested any of the management assets except the CFO and now huge enormous growth in the testing of 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 executives private equity back the final bit is families can take a long-term view and they do and it is less about those specific competencies than trust long-term orientation culture fit um And they're not going to give on any of those for performance. So I do think family-owned private companies take a different view around succession. uh, And then public and private equity back have nuances to them, but are largely intact, but families feel very different. Well, that makes sense that the, um, that sense of ownership is, is more palpable in a family company of the, you know, family names on the door or whatever it may be. So that, that, um, that, that trust makes a huge difference. Um, so let's come back to the board of directors and let's assume we're talking about a public company for the time being. You obviously have also, you've worked on CEO successions, also um, board successions in many, many different ways. Uh, we have done a lot of work on governance. And of course, the best companies have boards that are very long-term oriented and they react to whatever comes along, but they're, they've got their eye on the, on the prize over time. Um, how do you, but they're often, they're often cited when we talk to executives, the boards are often cited as a source of short-term pressure that board members are worried about the quarterly EPS or checking the stock price or whatever it might be, or saying, really, can we invest that much in you know, R&D or our employees or, or whatever it might be. So how do you think about um, the role that the boards play in being that sort of ballast for the long term rather than, you know, adding on to the short term pressure that the CEOs may be feeling from somewhere else? Right. So I think um, great question. So fundamentally, I believe the, the, the role of the Anglo-Saxon board in particular, because some of the Danish German and Swiss by structure and history or are, 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 are by nature longer term oriented. The Anglo-Saxon board post the financial crisis has changed significantly in its approach to succession and its approach to board composition. What are the fundamental two ultimate responsibilities of the board? Approve the strategy, choose the chief executive. Yes, we have audit committees and other things, but fundamentally you gotta get those right. Um, and, and the irony is, of course, we're pretty proud of being your partner um, and the research project we did today, Tone at the Top, the board's impact on long-term value. And as it relates to the board and succession, we have two big takeaways. First, boards that, that enable long-term sustainable activities take a very different approach to board composition and director selection. And those motivated by serving the company and their mission and less about themselves, their profile, uh, et cetera. So director recruitment and composition set the tone of of culture for the succession process. Uh, Second, those boards fundamentally, we have now proven with our joint study, 
operate differently than other boards. Their meetings are highly structured, they're well run, excellent communication, focused on long-term growth and performance. Uh, they stick to oversight, they're governors, they're great governors, they don't try to be operators. Um, and they're open to what I would say challenge and productive disagreements amongst themselves. Um, and, and they communicate, I think, incredibly clearly with management and external stakeholders. The lines of communication are wide open. Those are really well-run boards and really well-run boards run good succession processes. So it's almost, uh, is it a prerequisite to have a good succession process to have a, a good board? Can you have a good succession process without a good board or they, is it chicken or the egg? Or, you know, which comes first? <laughs> I think it's, I think it's tricky. I think it's tricky. Um, why? Because if the board, you could have some a, a great nom nomgov chair who's driving this through the committee, but fundamentally, if that board's not aligned, we've seen it multiple times where nomgov kind of pops up with an answer and goes to the full board, and the full board says, "Nope." That's not where we are. So you you could get there with a really great nominating governance committee and great communication, but board alignment uh, throughout is really determining great succession processes. So another important area of, of board composition and change over the last few years at least has been the push to get more women and people of color onto boards. Um, as well as a shift in the kind of skills that are in demand, such as understand the climate or having some sustainability expertise or understanding more about um, different stakeholders perhaps than historically. So how, how do you think the successful long-term companies are you know, really tackling this question and, and what does it take to create you, know, you talked a lot about the CEO of the future for the future strategy. What does it create to take to create the uh, the board of the future? So, so you know, I think I think the world, even in Japan and China, is in the midst of this right this moment. Um, started a few years ago, and then the pandemic has has heightened this or accelerated this focus on a great board. So, first, let's ask a great board asks a number of key questions. What skills and experiences are absent from this board to be great governors for this company? Number two, what skill sets are relevant for the com this company today and tomorrow, not yesterday? Third, are our boards and committees and individual directors all effectively contributing? So we tend to run towards individual um, board member evaluation but you also have to look at, is the committee effective at NOMGOV or compensation or audit? Um, and so look at the committees and the individuals. Um, are there any board leaders or committee leaders we could not replace if an incumbent left? So do we have bench strength for that, for that committee? Which again, comes back to the effectiveness of the previous point. And last, um, will our board recruitment and effectiveness activities withstand stakeholder scrutiny or activist scrutiny. So let's start with the five questions, okay? And I think uh, boards are doing this. It depends how um, effective the chair is uh, in understanding and listening to where it's going. And, and, and often, you know, you can have an omnipotent chair that, that holds this process back. Um, but boards have a fundamental responsibility to drive their own organization, their own board culture towards positive results. And not just financial, but sustainability, cyber, DEI, all of this improves it. And the last thing I'd say is there's often a fear of the first time director. Will I take the risk to name a board member for the first time? I, I fundamentally uh, disagree there's risk there. I would tell you, if you look at the last 21 years of operating experience. So tech bubble burst, economic issues, political issues, global financial crisis, pandemic, rapid growth, business transformation. The operators with 25 years experience, so they're 50 or, or more senior, 
they have some of the best 25 years of operating experience in the last 100 years since probably the Industrial Revolution. So a first time director has great operating experience and then you help them become a good governor. And we find really smart operators tend to only uh, ask questions when they need to, they listen, they're incredibly well prepared, they're not jaundiced. So, so on top of all this composition to get diversity of thought on your board, don't be afraid of a first time director. I'd love to get that message out um, more broadly. Uh, I think that, um, I, and with with uh, confession that I am a first time public company director, so I, I know I'm I'm learning. But it's interesting the number of conversations that I've had where I have recommended somebody, um, and the answer I get back is, "Oh, but they've never served on a on a public company board before." So uh, that that you know that that happens a lot. Now, one thing we've worked on recently, and again, I know you've done work here too, is the private equity portfolio company board. Um, many of the private equity firms um, have recognized that their boards historically have not been particularly diverse. They've had um, small boards. They've had perhaps operating partners that they've used multiple times, and many of them are thinking about how to um, change that. Is that a uh, is that a stepping stone to being a public company uh, board director? Is it too different? How do you think about serving on a private equity backed board versus a public company board as, as part of that um, building building the bench of, of directors broadly, if you will? I, I, I think it is fantastic experience. Um, and I, I take my hat off to Jim Coulter um, at TPG that set out to become the private equity firm uh, to lead with women directors about three or four years ago. <clears throat> and they have now over 85 women they have appointed to boards in uh, three years. And guess what happens? You have great people, whether it's people of color or women um, or LGBTQ. Uh, if you're dedicated and committed, guess what? They go to all their contemporaries and say, oh my gosh, you need to you know, get involved with TPG or whatever the case may be. So um, I think it feeds on itself. There are also, in America alone, there are over 13,000 private equity controlled or owned companies. Imagine if they only put one or two, which I think they will, uh, diverse directors on their boards as a training ground for larger public companies or, or simultaneous with large public companies. So I think it's a great uh, platform from which to learn, but by the way, um, it's about performance and, and transformation and improvement. It equally is if you could be frustrated with the compliance aspects of a public company in your board time, <laughs> the offset in a private equity is it's going to move fast. The risks are high, the capital structure is different, and, and it's going to move in, in a pace of transformation that might surprise some. So, you know, uh, health warning uh, at the same time is a recommendation. Yes, that's fair. There's uh, there's no hanging around. That's right. No. The top, uh, that's right. That's right. Um, well, we've talked a lot about uh, succession processes in public and private companies, uh, but you've been going through a succession process of your own um, at Russell Reynolds Associates. So uh, you've, I'm sure, have have learned some things from that. But can you can you tell us where that all stands and some of the lessons you've learned from um, you know, do, doing, do, going through it yourself rather than giving advice to others. Absolutely. So, okay, let's take a step back. We give all this advice on succession processes uh, and we needed to go through it ourselves. So it darn well uh, better be well, well, well planned, have flexibility and be well executed, which it has. So we started uh, three years in advance. I was working with the board. We have a nominating committee um, of the partnership in working with the board as well, even though we're structures, structures as a corporation, uh, and went through everything I just uh, talked about, uh, ultimately announced three candidates, ultimately went through presentations, ultimately were interviewed and took the same behavioral testing that we put our candidates through. So we did exactly the same process as a large public company, even though we're a, a smaller private company. And I'll be succeeded January 1st by Konstantin Alexandrakis, who runs all of our businesses in uh, the Americas, Canada, US, and Latin America. 
Um, and we went through the same thing. You know, one of my lessons learned, uh, uh, take a step back and depersonalize, right? Because if you're envisioning the company of the future, Russell Reynolds Associates of the future, it is not the same as the present. And so you'd be tempted to go, whoa, 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 but I tried that or I did that. That's not the point. It's about what the company needs in the future. So you darn well better put your ego uh, at the door. Uh, and it's not a mirror image of Clark Murphy. In fact, given the scale of how much we've grown and how much market share we've taken, the person needs to be quite different from Clark Murphy to be successful in the future. Um, you have to allow the constituents to uh, poke holes at what the future could or couldn't be. Um, and so for me, you have to be able to step back because the board drives this, not the CEO. Many CEOs try and that therein can lie the first flaw that current incumbent CEO should have nothing to do with the selection of the next person. They are accountable for the succession multi-year process. They are not to be involved in the selection. Um, so I found it slightly an out-of-body experience, but we did best in class and we have a fantastic result and we're envisioning what we'll be in two to four years. So your point about, you know, what skills are, are not there is that, that is a hard thing for a CEO because I think the most common thing that people do in recruiting is they look for mini me, you know, somebody who's just, right, just right. like yourself, but, you know, a few years behind or something, whereas, you know, what you're saying is oftentimes you kind of need to go from, you know, one side to, to something very different. And then maybe you go back to the, so, so how do CEOs both have that accountability for the process, be excited about the future, care about the company when they walk out the door, um, set that up right, but, uh, but, but let it go. Well, how, how would you counsel somebody to, 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 to walk that line? That they're accountable for the first several years. Of, in fact, the day they get the job, of course, but they're accountable to the board for great succession preparation in the early years of giving people different roles, different tests, uh, different feedback developmentally. Uh, and they're accountable for the progress of that. And there are many strong chief executives who don't like strong twos, threes, and fours, okay? The world is littered with those, those companies and people, but the board has to hold them accountable. And then with about a year to go, the board steps in and says, we got this, it's ours now, and we'll keep you informed. And I think for uh, chief executives, particularly longer tenured, particularly successful, um, and they're strong-willed, decisive people by nature, it's really hard to let go and they have to. And we have clients that the CEO asks for an extension. They won't leave their offices. They won't change the kind of the relationships. Signals are all important, but the board's in charge and not the chief executive with about a year to go. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so last question for you, which is, you know, tell us as, as you sort of look to the future and, and, and your future and Russell Reynolds Associates and what the, what's going on there next, what do, you, what do you think is something that's really exciting or different uh, that is coming down the pike? As you think about that next two to three to four years, um, what, 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 what's going to be really different as you look to the future here? I think in, in, uh, this aspect of ESG and sustainability I think a number of companies, investors are underestimating how powerful this will be negatively or positively to companies, chief executives, boards, and all stakeholders. And so we, about three years ago, went kind of long and deep into what makes up a sustainable leader. You and I have talked about in the past, our work with the United Nations Global Compact, and we have ultimately defined the framework of, of four points that we think differentiate successful, sustainable leaders from successful leaders. So I think this role, the world will depend on leadership and putting pledges into practice, not on governments or NGOs to make progress against the sustainable development goals. Uh, 
So, so if you take that as a, for granted, which we have, and we're going to really be focused, we're training and developing all of our people about how to identify, interview, uh, and reference sustainable leaders. We put sustainability into every one of our specifications now. And then we say to our clients, would you like us to probe into sustainability competencies or not? And you know, how, almost how can you say no, though some do. But then we started to look at how are the stakeholders viewing this? So we did a piece of research over the last year called Divides and Dividends, uh, which ultimately is how much of the talk is going into action. And we surveyed about 9,000 respondents across 11 countries. And we didn't just ask the C-suite leaders uh, the questions. We asked the next gen leaders and employees. And I won't go into it all now, but there are some fundamental illuminating points that come, particularly one of them is what we call the say, do, divide, which is the C-suite is saying, here's what we're up to, here's what we promise, here's what's happening. And the next gen and the employee base significantly disagree that they don't see the company doing what they heard was being said. So the say, do, divide. And ultimately great companies will retain I think employees and, and successful ones around a sustainable execution, consumers are gonna buy the products, institutional investors are gonna buy the stock. So I think this concept of the sustainable leader will define certainly who we are at Russell Reynolds Associates, we're way out in front on this, but it's gonna define how boards react to picking leaders and how institutional investors pick stocks. It's interesting you think that people are underestimating that, um, you know, I, I think, as you know, our mission is to uh, support a long-term sustainable and prosperous economy. Uh, so why do you think people are underestimating the sustainability push? It may be that those of us, um, you know, like FCLT, talk to people who uh, care about sustainability a lot. We We sort of feel we've been around for five years. We feel like at the beginning of that five years, we were trying to convince people a lot that this was really important. And now we mostly get, yeah, it's important, but but how? But it sounds like you're saying, no, in the real world, there's still a lot of people who are, are very, are underestimating it. So how do, how, do we, uh, how do we ensure people don't underestimate it? Is it just uh, continue to, to beat the drum? Something else, yeah, maybe it's- no, I, I think it's happening faster than that. I, I, I call it a barbell. Institutional investors are picking their companies and employees are picking their employment. And it's gonna come and a squeeze a barbell from both ends, number one. Number two, uh, consumers are gonna pick the products. Number three, nations can't make the progress for all the reasons we know in political polarization now. And so the, the heavy lifting will fall to the companies who have all these profits. And I'm not saying you turn into a nonprofit. I'm a, I'm a, you know, a, a for-profit person, but I do believe in the stakeholder concept. And I can tell you from the board conversations we have all over the world, Italy, even I was on a conference call last Friday morning with a Chinese huge state-owned enterprise that must comply with the, the road, uh, Belt and Road Initiative of, of clean air, cleaner air, to obviously Germany in the green focus of the green in these uh, current elections to the UK, to obviously America with renewable energy. This is happening right now. And the best boards that we're working with, they're on it. And so those that either are skeptical about doing well and doing good, or we won't give up profits for the planet, I think they're out to lunch. And we're sitting with institutional investors BlackRock, State Street, Wellington, Vanguard, um, Scottish Widows, they're on this. So it's happening with them or without them. Uh, and I think those that ignore it or, or slow go it are in for a big surprise. Yeah, well, like I couldn't agree more. And um, I think that as we think about that future-oriented CEO or that future-oriented board that you were talking about, it's hard to envision uh, future-oriented companies that do not take this into account. So um, that it will, 
that that will be one of those shortcuts that uh, that that will 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 lead to nowhere. So, um, well, thank you so much, Clark, for joining us today, and thank you for um, all of the work that Russell Reynolds Associates has done on these critical topics, both um, with FCLT, but also with the the UN and many other organizations. And we really, um, really appreciate your leadership and um, and your your thoughts today. Thank you. Well, listen, thanks for having us. And I hope, Sarah, you'll, you'll, we'll have a reciprocal that you'll join me in our podcast, which is called Redefiners, which uh, Nanaz Matashami and I host, which is just talking about these issues, business leaders who have redefined their industry or their company. Um, and so um, come join us on that one and we can compare notes. It'd be fantastic. All right. We'd love to. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Going Long with FCLT Global. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org.